Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is Sam Finnerty. I'm a partner at Flera Mazza. Thanks for joining us this afternoon for this webinar. We are going to be talking about a very important topic, which is size and status recertification. We're going to talk about what it is and why it matters for government contractors, uh, particularly small business contractors and contractors that have different socioeconomic designations. Sorry, okay. So kick things off here, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. Um, like I said, I'm a partner at Polaro Mazza. I work in the government contracts practice group. Um, my practice uh, really, really touches all facets of government contracting. I help clients, um, you know, from, from cradle to grave with procurement related issues, from, you know, navigating, getting themselves set up in SAM, entering into, you know, mentor protege programs, uh, getting themselves certified under SBA's different small business programs and pursuing teaming arrangements with other contractors, uh, putting subcontracts together, analyzing solicitations to see if there's any regulatory concerns or, um, you know, concerns for them as they're putting proposals together to dealing with award-related issues and disputes, bid protests. I help clients litigate claims against the federal government, requests for equitable adjustment. Um, I also help clients uh, put together joint venture agreements, and I counsel clients with a, a wide array of regulatory compliance issues arising under the FAR and SBA regulations. I'll tell you a bit about our firm, Polaro Mazza. We are a business law firm that serves as a strategic partner to government contractors and commercial businesses. Uh, we have a large government contract practice, and we also have uh, a few other practice groups that sort of specialize in representing government contractors, commercial businesses. Um, we have a litigation group, a, a corporate group, a construction group, and a labor and employment group um, that, that all, you know, help our, our clients with different issues that arise in those practice areas. Our government contracts group handles a lot of the different um, topics that are covered here, you know, like I mentioned, we cover a lot of transactional issues, um, organizational issues, putting strategic partnerships together, um, you know, bid protests, size protests, and then a lot of, of counseling and, and compliance concerns. So today's topic, recertification, we're going to be addressing, this is an overview here of what we're going to be addressing. We're going to be talking about when it is that a firm needs to certify or what we're going to be talking about today, recertify their size or socioeconomic status. We're going to talk about the different events that trigger an obligation for contractors to recertify their size and socioeconomic status. We're going to touch on what competitors of yours might be doing wrong when they are certifying or failing to certify. Um, they could make them the subject of size or status protests, which are things that you want to avoid. Um, so you want to make sure that, that you're complying with these different requirements that we're going to touch on today so that you're setting yourself up for success should you, uh, you know, find yourself being awarded a set-aside contract. Um, you know, you, you want to be protest-proof. You can't prevent someone from filing a size or status protest, but you can make sure you've got your, your house in order so that you have good defenses um, to shoot down, uh, you know, that type of challenge to your, to your award. And we're going to talk at the end about you know, why all of this is important, uh, because when you're making certifications, those are, um, you know, material to your contract. And if you make false certifications, there can certainly be ramifications and liability for that, which is something we obviously want to avoid. So to kick things off here, I'm just going to explain a little bit of the regular, regulatory background behind our topic of, of recertification today. So, you know, uh, the big requirement is that operators for government contracts have to be registered in SAM, the System for Reward Management, at the time that they submit an offer um, for procurement. There are some exceptions, uh, and they have to comply with the FAR's annual representation and certification requirements. If you submit an offer, you are essentially verifying that the reps and certs that you have in SAM have been updated in the last year and that they're current, accurate, and complete, except for changes that you might specifically identify within your offer. Um, unless the acquisition is exempt under the FAR, 
the contracting officer is in turn required to verify that any offeror is registered in SAM at the time of an, uh, that it submits its offer. Um, the key thing that we're talking about today is it relates to SAM registration and reps and certs are the reps and certs pertaining to your size and socioeconomic status. Uh, this is a critically important concept to understand. This can often be the factor that leads to a size or status process. There is um, a lot of confusion and uncertainty as to, you know, size is measured at a, size and status are measured at a certain point in time, and you could, you know, maintain your size and status for certain contracts well beyond the date uh, on which you, you know, grown to no longer be small or when you've, you know, had a, something occur to the business that means that you no longer qualify of a certain socioeconomic status. That said, your, your reps and SAM are always supposed to be accurate and current, so they might not conflict. They might, there might be some conflict between what SAM says and your actual eligibility for a contract. So oftentimes people go to SAM when they see, you know, their competitor be awarded a contract and if they have doubts pertaining to their size or status, you know, they see in SAM that they're perhaps not listed as small anymore or not of a certain socioeconomic status and that tips them off for filing a, a size or status protest. So yeah, just talking about quickly about what the reps and certs are that are required in SAM, there's um, a couple of different FAR clauses here that, that touch upon these, these different reps and certs. The small business program representations are, are key to our presentation today here. And with those representations, you have to verify your size status for all the uh, NAICS codes that you are selecting to do business under in SAM. And you have to also check the box within SAM to indicate your uh, representation for different size and socioeconomic statuses. So you can check the box for small business, um, SDB, um, but note that you, you can't self-check an 8A box in SAM. 8A is something that has to be you know, verified and approved by SDA. Um, BOSB, Service Disabled Better Known Small Business, this used to be a, a self-check, but uh, now as of you know, January 1st of this year, it's moved over to the SBA to a formal certification program. Um, that being said, there's different grace periods that have been established where, you know, you could essentially be, quote, self-certifying uh, and not have to be SBA approved if your CBE period is, was still active. Um, and there was a, also a one-year grace period. The others here, um, Woman-owned small business, hub zone, you can check the box for those. Woman-owned small business, but there's also now a certification program for uh, the women-owned small business program. So what are the requirements for updating these different reps and certs that you're including in SAM? You have to review and update them as necessary, but at least annually to ensure that they're accurate, current, and complete. And they are generally effective um, for one year from the date of your last update. So, you know, this is this is an area where contractors will often, uh, you know, update their reps in, in SAM and then, you know, operate under the assumption that everything's fine because they're, you know, a small business for, for another year because they only have to update every year. But that, of course, is not the case. Size is determined at a certain point in time. So, you know, like I said earlier, what's in SAM might not be a true representation of your actual um, status or eligibility for a specific procurement. So when um, do you have to re-represent under this FAR? This is, this is a, a common clause that's included in set-aside contracts. You have to re-represent under the FAR, and it was recently updated um, to now make clear that not only are there obligations to re-represent your size status, but you also have to re-represent your socioeconomic status. And here are the three different triggering events under the FAR. You have to re-represent within 30 days of the execution of a novation agreement, within 30 days of the um, completion of a merger or an acquisition, where novation wasn't required, and you know I'll talk a little bit more about that later. 
And then for long-term contracts that exceed five years, you have to recertify your size and socioeconomic status prior to the end of the year of the contract and then prior to any option period thereafter being exercised. So the, 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 then the, the big question becomes, you know, how do you actually go about re-representing under the FAR? What's the, the obligation for a contractor? And there's not a ton of information uh, in the regulations on exactly how you do this. So there is some, you know, there, there are some open questions as to what would be a, a sufficient, uh, you know, way to actually recertify. But a couple things that are clear is that you have to actually go into SAM, update those reps and certs to ensure that they are reflecting your current status. And then if it is uh, a re-representation in connection with any of the three triggering events I just spoke about, then you have to actually notify the contracting officer in writing within the time frame specified. Uh, so again, that was you know 30 days for innovations and mergers or 60 to 120 days um, if you're talking about re recertifying a connection with a long-term contract. Now, here's where there's a little bit of a, of a gray area because the regulations just say that you have to notify the contracting officer of your, you know, new size status or, you know, worst case scenario, you have to inform them that you're no longer small or that you're no longer of the applicable socioeconomic status. But there's not really a, a, a lot of detail as to what that notification has to look like. Um, so, you know, we generally advise our clients that it can it usually just be an email to the contracting officer as far as what you say in the email. Um, you know, there's some there's some room for interpretation there as far as the actual uh, scope of that recertification beyond simply informing them of your status. So, you know, the, the, the follow on question then is you've, you've got these annual reps and certs in SAM, you've got to update them and keep them current and accurate. There are certain triggering events that are gonna require you to actually expressly recertify before your annual uh, renewal within SAM. And then let's just say that you have to make one of these recertifications. Well, what's the, what's the effect of that type of recertification? So what, what the FAR says is that if you recertify and you inform the agency that you're no longer small or no longer of you know, the relevant socioeconomic status that we're talking about, you know, for example, a SDVSB set aside. Um, once you do that, the FAR says that the agency can no longer include the value of any options, exercise, modifications issued, orders issued, or purchases made under BPAs um, on that contract in their small business or socioeconomic goals going forward. So that's the, the key thing is that the, once you do this, the agency is not supposed to be taking credit anymore. Whether they do take credit, um, you know, that's really that's really their prerogative. Uh, I, you know, I, I think I can say with some confidence that I don't think agencies are always getting this correct. Recertification is a complicated and confusing area of the law. Uh, and, and, you know, I think contracting officers get confused by it. Contractors get confused by it. But what's supposed to happen is that the agency is supposed to stop, stop taking credit once they've been informed that you're no longer, you know, of the applicable size or status for the contract. The agency is also supposed to, within 30 days of getting that re-representation, supposed to issue a modification to the contract, capturing the re-representation, and report it in the Federal Procurement Database System, FPDS, um, which is now uh, captured within SAM, and they have to update your size in FPDS or SAM. Um, again, whether those things always happen uh, within 30 days, you know, that's not always the case, certainly, but that's what the agencies are supposed to be doing. So the reason that I'm going to make a distinction here between the FAR and SBA regulations, the way we're going to go through this presentation is we're going to talk about what the requirements are under, under the FAR for re-representation, and then what the FAR says about what the effect of re-representation is. And then as we go through, we're also going to talk about what the SBA regulations say with regard to recertification and what <clears throat> the regulatory effect is of a recertification under SBA's regulations. The reason that there is a distinction is because SBA is really the arbiter of all issues related to size 
And if there's a question of size or status, there's a protest filed, SBA is going to be the one deciding it, and they're going to be deciding it under their regulation. That being said, SBA's regulations are nine times out of ten, they would not be mentioned in any way in your contract. Instead, you'd have your, the FAR clauses in your contract, and those are the clauses the contracting officers understand. Those are the ones that they have to read and study, and those are the ones that they use and refer to when administering contracts. So there's a little bit of a disconnect, um, particularly because the FAR, as it relates to all these representations slash recertifications, SBA calls it recertification, the FAR calls it re-representation. Um, but there's a little bit of a disconnect because SBA is the one that created the recertification rules in their regulations. And they have updated them and tinkered with them and modified them a number of times over the last you know, decade plus. And the FAR has enacted rules to essentially codify SBA's rules. But the FAR usually lags behind any, any SBA change that's made. The FAR usually lags behind five or six years in getting up to date with the latest and greatest version of SBA rules. So what that means for us today is that SBA's rules on recertification are a lot more detailed, um, particularly because they tinkered with the recertification rules a lot in the last two to three years, and those have not yet found their way to the FAR, um, which just means that for a contractor, navigating how to comply with the recertification rules you really got to look at both sets of regulations um, because, and then you need, to, you need to understand that there might be some, a little bit of an education process to the extent you're going back and forth with an agency on a specific issue because the agency is going to most likely be looking at the FAR and they are probably not up to speed on the latest and greatest SBA changes. Um, but ultimately, you know, your size status is controlled by SBA's regulations. So those um, are, are where you should be paying a particular amount of time uh, getting up to speed on things, but just keeping in mind that there is a little bit of a disconnect. So, you know, you're going to have your contractual requirements, which are going to be governed by the clauses in your contract, which are going to be the FAR clauses. But then separate and apart from that, as a small business, you have these, this obligation to comply with different SBA regulations particularly because if anybody protests your size or status, those are the regulations that FBA is going to apply. So with that, um, with that big caveat, I'll now jump into size recertification requirements under SBA regulations. So like the FAR, SBA requires that you recertify your size uh, and socioeconomic status within 30 days of an ovation, 30 days of a merger sale or acquisition becoming final where contract novation is not required. So that would basically look like a situation where company A as a small business gets acquired by company B, um, but it survives the acquisition and company A remains a subsidiary of company B. So therefore company A doesn't have to novate or transfer any of its contracts to company B. It is just now owned 100% by company B, but it remains a going concern. So that would be a merger sale. And in that, in that case, that would be an acquisition where contract innovation is not required. Now, um, skipping down a little further in the slide here under SBA regulations, you also have to recertify at, uh, at the 50 year mark of a long term contract, both that's over five years. and um, prior to any option being exercised thereafter. Where SBA gets a little more nuanced though is that what, as it relates to mergers, sales, and acquisitions, they talk about a little more detail about the nuances of when recertification is required and from whom. The regulation says that when a concern or an affiliate of a concern is acquired, then recertification is required from both the acquired and the acquiring concerns if each has been awarded a small contract. There's a rule in SBA's regulations that's not in the FAR yet that talks about joint ventures and when joint ventures have to recertify. Um, the rule there is that if you're a joint venture and one of them, you're in a joint venture, let's just keep it, keep it 
simple for um, purposes of this example. Let's just say there's two members in the joint venture. One of those joint venture members goes through an acquisition after the joint venture has been acquired a contract, then um, awarded a contract. The JV is going to have to recertify as a result of that member going through an acquisition. But if the other company has not gone through an acquisition, then only the, the member of the joint venture that went through an acquisition is going to have to recertify its size or socioeconomic status to the procuring agency. And this is important because, let's say a joint venture is a small business joint venture, has two small business members, and after being awarded a contract, at some point down the road, joint venture member A, that was small when it was awarded the contract, just organically grows and is no longer small. And then company B, member B, gets acquired by another company. But as a result of the acquisition, it's let's just say it's still a small business. So now the JV has to recertify as a result of that acquisition of company B. And the joint venture recertifies, but only company B has to recertify and explain that, hey, we were acquired, we're actually still small. Company A doesn't have to recertify because in this case now, which, which is a good thing in the rule because company A, if it did have to recertify, it would have to say that it's no longer small because it's organically grown over you know, the ensuing time from when the contract was awarded. But it doesn't have to recertify. So just the company that goes through the triggering event has to recertify. It's a complicated rule there, um, but that's sort of the, the, uh, the big takeaway on the joint venture rule. SBA also has a rule talking about recertification of pending proposals. So this rule says that if you go through a merger, sale, or acquisition, you submit a bid, right? You then go through a merger, sale, or acquisition, um, and this acquisition gets finalized after you submit your offer, but prior to any award being announced, then you have to recertify to the contracting officer for that procurement. So this is the, the pending proposal recertification rule, essentially. Um, and you know this rule was enacted by FBA to sort of try and close the loop on situations where you know companies that are small submit bids, knowing that they're about to be acquired by a large company. They try to get one more small business contract, you know, weeks before the acquisition being finalized, um, and then they announce the deal and they you know still get this small business contract. So this new rule, which I call the 180-day rule says that if you recertify, if you have to recertify on a pending proposal because of an acquisition or a sale or a merger, and the deal that you're recertifying um, occurred within 180 days of the offer, and as a result of this transaction going through, you're no longer small, well, the rule then says that you're actually not eligible for award of that contract. Here, SBA was trying to you know, avoid that situation where you're doing a transaction really close in time to submitting a bid for a small business contract and know that as a result of the transaction, you're not going to be small anymore. But SBA realized that you know, sometimes you submit bids, the procurement process can take a really long time. I mean, it can take more than a year on some of these contracts if there's protests and you know, corrective actions and solicitation amendments. And they recognize that they don't want to be stifling companies from making business decisions about their growth and, you know, in this case, their potential inorganic growth caused by being acquired. Um, so they, you know, modified the rule to also say that if the deal occurs 180 days after you submit your offer, so the deal closes 180 days after you submit your offer, then you actually can still get the award, but the agency just is not permitted to take small business credit. Um, so that's a mouthful, but that's the, the, the pending proposal rule that's unique to SBA's regulations that you're not going to find if you're just looking in the FAR. The other rule is that recertification, in addition to all of these situations, it can also be required for a IDIQ type contract on a task order by task order basis whenever the contracting officer specifically requires recertification in connection with the order. So status recertification under SBA's regulations. The, the rule I just mentioned, there's a there's a very similar rule um, under all of the different socioeconomic programs uh, that require 
you know, the same things for status that you recertify within 30 days of innovation, mm -hmm. acquisition, or on long-term contracts. Um, one other thing to keep in mind is that this rule that I just touched upon on, on in the, the prior slide here, this is how the rule looks under SBA's regulations talking about size recertification. The rule is not as detailed uh, when it finds its way into the SDBOC, woman-owned small business, hub zone, um, 8A regulations. There's, there's not as uh, there's not as many uh, specific modifications to the rule that provide explanation. So, you know, one example is that the socioeconomic regulations, when talking about recertification, they do not mention the pending proposal 180-day rule I just touched on. So just keep that in mind as it, as it could, you know, have implications for you um, as it relates to a, a specific socioeconomic set aside that you're, you're performing under. So now, like I said, I was going to, I'm going to explain what the effect of recertification is under SBA's regulations. And here, it's a, there's, a, there's a whole lot of case law that's interpreted SBA's regulations. Um, and so there's just, there's going to be more fulsome analysis here of what recertification means uh, in the context of SBA versus uh, the FAR. So I'm going to start by talking about what we know for sure, and then I'm going to touch on some issues that are a little bit less clear. So what we know for sure is that, like the FAR, if you recertify as other than small or no longer of the applicable socioeconomic status for a specific procurement, the agency can no longer take credit from that point going forward towards their small business socioeconomic goals. You guys, um, as contractors, need to re revise applicable federal contract databases like SAM. The agency has to do so as well. Everything's supposed to get updated in all those databases to reflect your new size or socioeconomic status. In the context of a multiple award contract, if you recertify a small um, or no longer the, the correct status or the required status rather, just keep in mind that that could lead to the agency off-ramping you, um, you know, which they could do by essentially terminating your contract for convenience. And to know whether or not that's a possibility, you really want to look at the terms of those um, MACs that you have. There's certain ones that do have off-ramping language. Uh, I believe Oasis has some of that off-ramping language. Others are structured to basically say, you know, hey, you, you have a small business contract here, but if you inform us that you've been acquired by a large company, then we're going to put you in dormant status, and you're going to be able to continue performing the task orders you have but you're not going to be eligible to bid any new work. And once you've finished completing the current task orders you have, then we're going to terminate your contract for convenience. Um, so just, you know, that's important, particularly as you're navigating, you know, the value of those contracts as it relates to, you know, the value perhaps of going through an acquisition um, and what that looks like as, as far as what the runway is that you're going to have on some of these different small business contracts. If the, age, if the agency explicitly requires you to recertify for a task order, then SBA is going to determine your size slash status at the time that you submit your offer for that order. So that is obviously important because the general rule is that you retain your size and status for the life of a contract, including task orders that are issued there under. Um, but CEOs have discretion to require you to recertify. So, uh, the, you know, I don't think that discretion is exercised widely, but um, you know, it's hard to say whether there's going to be an uptick in the CEOs requesting that over time. Um, so just important to, to have that in the back of your mind. For any 8A contract, if, you know, the general rule is that if your ownership or control changes, i.e., you know, you go through an acquisition or a merger or something to that effect, then the 8A contract is, is more likely than not um, going to be or at least supposed to be terminated for convenience. There's, you know, some exceptions. Um, there's a waiver process that you can go through to try to avoid that, but that's the general rule for 8A contracts. But um, conversely, for other types of set-aside contracts and small business contracts, just because you recertify, there's no requirement that an agency terminate your contract unless, you know, there's off-ramping provision uh, in the contract like I just touched upon. But there's nothing under the regulations that expressly requires that. 
So I'm going to just briefly here talk about how do you know if a task order recertification request has been made because this is, uh, you know, this is a pretty critically important thing. You know, you get a, a you, know, you get a multiple award contract that's then set aside for small business, and at some point during the performance of that contract, you uh, grow to no longer be small, um, but you'd like to keep bidding. And the agency issues the task order solicitation, and the language seems to mention, you know, the fact that you have to be small, or that they're going to check SAM when they look at your proposal um, to ensure that you're eligible. So it's important to have a you know, a general understanding of whether a task order solicitation is in fact making a request for recertification, in which case you would need to certify that you're small when you submit the task order bid. So the general rule is that a, a task order recertification request has to be explicit and it has to include the size standard in effect at the time of the recertification that, that corresponds to the NAICS code assigned to the contract. So some important things to keep in mind, however, although the regulations say that it needs to be explicit, um, it doesn't necessarily have to use the, the language in a solicitation, it doesn't necessarily have to use the word certify or recertify or re-represent or anything to that effect for it to be considered explicit. However, just simply setting a task order aside and including you know, the standard FAR rep inserts clauses that we talked about at the outset, that's not going to be enough to deem the solicitation um, to be including uh, an explicit recertification request. But in looking at this type of situation, SBA's Office of Hearings and Appeals will consider whether the solicitation was reasonably understood as a request to recertify the task order. So it's sort of like a totality of the circumstances analysis, which is not always that helpful because as we've seen the case law develop, it's become a little bit more murky um, and arguments can you know, oftentimes be made on both sides as to whether a solicitation truly is requesting recertification unless it is you know, abundantly clear. Um, so some of the things that can, you know, that can include a recertification request are the Q&A to, to solicitation. So keep in mind that the way an, an agency answers a certain question in a Q&A, that, that could be your basis right there for concluding that recertification is being requested. Um, there's also been some recent case law indicating that in making, in doing this analysis, you, you can actually also look to the terms of the master IDIQ, you know, MAC that you're working with here, because sometimes the, the MAC says at the outset, hey, all the task orders that are competed here under are going to require that the contractor recertify and be small as of the date it submits its task order bid. Well, if that's in the MAC, then that's pretty strong language to suggest that if a task order solicitation comes out, that it's going to require that the contractor be small as of the date it submits its bid. Um, there's also some case law that suggests that OHA, in doing this analysis, is going to give consideration to what the contracting officer thought they were doing or asking for when they submitted the uh, when they issued the solicitation. So backing up now, I'm going to talk about what the effect of recertification is under SBA's regulations, which, like I said, there's been a lot more um, analysis done here, uh, particularly with, you know, parsing the language in the regulation. So I talked about what the issues are that are clear earlier. <clears throat> now I'm going to talk about some of the issues that are less clear. So first thing is, you know, answering the question of what contracts are we recertifying? You know, how are we doing this recertification? What does it look like? So the rule that talks about needing to recertify in connection with a contract novation. So that's a situation where, um, you know, through a let's say an asset purchase agreement, company A sells a bunch of assets associated with performing a certain contract to company B, and as part of selling all of the assets associated with performing that contract it then also transfers the contract to company B. And the transfer gets recognized and approved by the government through what's called a novation agreement. So now company B has the contract. The contract has been novated to them, and they are now the named contractor performing the contract. The regulation that says you've got to recertify 
when there's an ovation, it says that the contractor has to be certified to the procuring agency, and if they can't, then the agency can no longer count the options or orders issued pursuant to the contract from that point going forward. So the question is, does the company that the contract is novated to, they certainly have to recertify under the contract that they just received. They have to tell the agency, hey, we just got this contract and we're a small business too. So company A that, that transferred the contract to us, they were small, we're still small, this contract is going to continue to be performed by a small business. But do they also, the question is, do they also have to recertify their size status or socioeconomic status under all of their other contracts? Um, it's an open question, but what I can say is that the, the underlying language here in the, in the presentation that is in the regulation it at least suggests that the, the recertification when you're talking about innovation is, is limited to the innovated contract. So let's say company B um, you know, acquires a contract with company A. Company B unfortunately has to tell the procuring agency for that contract that, you know, hey, we're actually not small for this contract. Um, but let's say company B has a bunch of other small business contracts, but they've since grown organically and they're no longer small, but they're still performing those small business contracts. Well, you know, ideally they'd like to avoid having to reach out to all of those procuring agencies and say, hey, we're no longer small for all of these contracts. Um, so that's, that's the outcome they would like um, naturally. And, you know, I think the regulation can be read to indicate that when you're talking about novation, the recertification requirement is limited to the novated contract. Now, jumping ahead, what about when we're talking about a merger or sale or an acquisition um, where there isn't a novation? Well, in that case, you have to, again, recertify the procuring agency, uh, but recertification is required from both the acquired and the acquiring concern if each has been awarded a contract as a small business. That language is clearly in the regulation. So if you're talking about a merger, sale, or acquisition, then the recertification requirement is on both sides of the transaction. So both companies to deal have to recertify. Once the transaction is finalized, both companies have to recertify all their small business contracts. So that's a key distinction there when you're going through a merger, sale, or acquisition. There's, there's, a, there's a clear obligation to recertify on both sides. Um, one thing I want to flag is that the regulation was revised a few years ago to require recertification from the acquired and the acquiring concern, and it was expressly modified to also require recertification from affiliates. However, what the regulation says is that recertification is required when a concern or an affiliate of the concern acquires or is acquired by another concern. And then it goes on to say who has to recertify, and it says that the recertification is required from both the acquired concern and the acquiring concern. It doesn't say in that part of the regulation when it's talking about who has to recertify, doesn't say that recertification is actually required from the affiliate. Um, so based on that language, you know, I think it can still be argued that affiliates aren't actually required to recertify because the regulation, although it was pretty clearly enacted for that purpose, it, it doesn't seem like they got it perfectly clear on that point when they were actually tweaking the words in the regulation. Um, that argument, again, it, it hasn't been tested, um, so it's really unclear, you know, how that argument would play out if SBA was to analyze it in a specific situation or if their office hearings and appeals was to analyze it, but um, just just food for thought for the group um, as you know you're looking at different types of structures for transactions and, and perhaps you know either trying to argue that affiliate recertification was required or trying to argue that affiliate recertification was not required. So the, the big question um, that has always been at you know the center of the recertification discussion is how does recertification affect long-term you know, IDIQ type multiple award contracts? Um, so I'm just gonna briefly describe a, a case that occurred that's sort of 
provided some much needed clarity in this area of the law. Um, there was a, a size appeal of Odyssey Systems back in 2021, where an appellant argued that the awardee of two task orders under GSA's OASIS um, Small Business Pool 5 contract, they argued that they were ineligible for award because the awardee had merged with a private equity firm a month after submitting their bid. And you know, as a result, they were clearly no longer small. Um, according to the company that filed this um, protest, the size protest, it, you know, that acquisition triggered their obligation to, trigger the awardee's obligation to recertify, and they argued that it should have rendered them ineligible for award. Um, and in making this argument, they relied on that pending proposal recertification rule that I touched on earlier, which says that you know if the if the merger, sale, or acquisition occurs within 180 days of your offer, and you can't recertify a small, then you're not eligible for award. So it seems like a sort of open and shut case because the facts you know naturally seem to fall within um, that that context. It was definitely 100 within 180 days, and they definitely weren't small. Um, but interestingly, the appeal was the, the protest and then the appeal were denied because OHA looked at a different section of SBA's size recertification regulation, which indicates that while the recertification rules talking about needing to recertify in connection with merger sales and acquisitions, while those rules, including the 180 day rule, Applied a multiple award contract like the Oasis vehicle at issue here in this case. There's a separate part of the regulation that says if the multiple award contract was set aside for small business, like this Oasis Pool 5 contract was, then if there's a novation or a merger or acquisition and the contractor is now no longer small, the agency can't count any, and the operative language is new orders issued pursuant to the contract towards its small business goal. And this includes set asides reserved for, you know, hub zone, SWSBs, WSBs, A Day. Um, and basically SBA provided some comments in connection with this case, indicating that this rule that I just referenced is an exception to the 180 day rule when you're talking about a contract that is a set aside IDIQ contract. And in this case, SBA argued that the firm was still eligible for pending and future task orders, including the two task orders that it had been awarded in this case. And that the outcome was that the agency just wasn't allowed to take credit. And OHA agreed. And, you know, to sort of put this on the context, why this decision came out this way. The regulation says when you're talking about set aside max and you have one of these triggering events, merger, innovation, acquisition, and you, you can't recertify a small, the agency says the, 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 sorry, the regulation says the agency can't count any new orders. And so SBA and OHA basically concluded that it wouldn't make sense to say that they can't count new orders towards their goals if the contractor wasn't in the first instance actually eligible for the new order. So basically they said that language is in the regulation and it wouldn't make sense for us to say that, hey, the agency can't count new orders towards the small business goals if the contractor wasn't in fact eligible for those orders. If they weren't eligible for those orders in the first place, then there'd be no reason to make a distinction that the agency shouldn't be taking credit. So. A little bit of a linguistic battle there with what the regulation says, but the big takeaway from it, um, which OHA doubled down on in a, a case about a year later, is that under SBA's recertification rules, the recertification of a company as other than small in connection with a novation, a merger, sale, or an acquisition is not itself going to preclude the contractor from being eligible to bid on future orders set aside under pre-existing long-term set-aside contracts. Like, you know, as that case was dealing with Oasis, for example. 
Um, that's significant because it means that if you have one of these big set aside vehicles and you go through uh, you know, an acquisition, um, then although you might not be small as a result of that acquisition, that doesn't necessarily in and of itself preclude you from being able to continue to use that contract vehicle to bid for future set asides. Um, and that you know you could still be eligible for those set asides even though you aren't small anymore. Um, thing to keep in mind is that this this is talking about five status. Um, like I mentioned, there's a little bit of uh, distinction between the size recertification rules and SBA's socioeconomic recertification rules, and that the socioeconomic rules aren't, uh, they don't include as many of the details like the pending proposal rule that was at issue in this Odyssey case. Um, so, a little bit of a, put a little bit of a exclamation point here on this because there's, you know, some questions as to how this would all shake out if we were talking about, uh, you know, let's say an SDVOSB order under um, an SDVOSB IDIQ, but um, but since the regulations are sort of modeled after each other, you know, we think it's probably at least arguable that the outcome should be the same. The reason these are these cases that I just mentioned are, are really significant is because there's been a lot of confusion over the last few years as to what the heck the real effect of recertification is on long-term contracts. Because that's, you know, it's it, it's obviously clear if you recertify as other than small, well, then you can't go out and bid totally new contracts that are set aside for small business. But everyone has always had questions around, well, what about the contracts we already have that we spent a lot of time going after and, you know, we won them and we certified at the time and qualified at the time as small or some applicable status. You know, what about those contracts? And strangely enough, it wasn't too long ago that the guidance seemed to be going in the opposite direction, um, meaning that, you know, recertification would affect your eligibility going forward. There was, in fact, a, a case a few years back um, under, it was interpreted under a slightly different version of SBA's recertification rules. I know I mentioned they've been tinkered with a lot over time here, where, um, you know, it was, it was a similar issue. And at, at, in, in that case, at least, SBA actually expressed its belief there that once you recertify, you shouldn't be eligible for future set-aside orders under pre-existing set-aside contracts. Um, that case is mentioned here at the, at the bottom of this slide. Um, so when that case came out, you know, it, it caused a big uproar and people thought, okay, well, wait, now we're not eligible. Um, SBA is saying that you lose your eligibility even though there's a general rule that you keep it for the life of the contract. Um, so we've been sort of operating in a limbo since this 2018 case and you know, flash forward a couple of years from that, it seems like the winds are blowing in the opposite direction now, um, and the contractors should, you know, have a little bit more assurance that their size is actually going to be locked in on these long-term contracts, um, despite despite recertification, unless of course there are, you know, specific facts like the terms of the contract require off-ramping, um, or you're dealing with a, you know, perhaps a, a different version or a different um, regulation than size regulation that I just talked about here. So I'm going to touch a little bit on protest considerations. Generally, if you're going to, you know, if you try to protest someone's size or socioeconomic status, there's a few points in time at which you can do that. Um, you have to do it prior to the close of the fifth business day after you get notified that the uh, of the of the identity of the prospective awardee for the contract or an order where recertification was requested um, and if you're talking about an unrestricted mac then anytime there is an order issued under one of those you can file a protest within five days as well unless you're talking about orders or bpas issued under um, federal supply schedule. So SBA made, SBA made a rule change a couple of years back where they basically said that you've got to recertify. If you're dealing with, a, if you get awarded an unrestricted IDIQ contract that's not set aside, but the agency thereafter decides to set aside orders, you have to re, you have to certify small and qualify small for each of those orders unless you're talking about 
um, the GSA schedule. So you can also file a size protest in connection with a certification made um, prior to the issuance of the five-year option on a long-term contract or a contract uh, an option exercise after that. Um, keep in mind there's no size, there's no time limit on size or, or status protest initiated by the contracting officer or SBA. And if you file an untimely size or status protest, it has to still be forwarded to SBA. So there could be reasons that you might want to file one of these protests, even if you miss your window to file a timely protest, because depending on the issues and the proof that you can provide, it's possible the contracting officer or SBA might adopt the protest on their own. Um, you can't protest 8A status, but you can protest the size status of an awardee under a competitive 8A contract. So, you know, what are some of the reasons why, um, you know, people find themselves in hot water and, and find themselves getting protested, having size or status protests? It, it, you know, you, you might be failing to account for revenues or employees of your affiliates. Um, you might not be, uh, you know, former affiliates. If you, you know, if you, if you sell a bit, if you sell a part of your company or you have a company that you get rid of as a former affiliate, you can back out those receipts. Um, and then, you know, the new company would have to account for those receipts. So there's a lot of different issues that can arise with how you're accounting for your revenues and your employees when you're dealing with employee based size standards uh, in the context of affiliates. Affiliation is a whole other topic that we could, you know, we could give a presentation on, but that is a, a big issue um, that leads to companies having size protests filed against them. Um, also, you know, not not correctly accounting for receipts um, from joint ventures that you're members of. If you, you know, are not, honestly, one of the big reasons people file these types of protests is based on information they find online. So, you know, you announce, if you announce an acquisition or a deal, um, that might give company reason to think that, hey, this company just got acquired, they're no longer small. Or if you have a website that's you know, outdated and it, it lists you as part of a family of companies that you're not actually a family, you're not actually um, you know, associated with anymore, you know, that could give someone a basis to say, hey, it looks like this company is really you know, a much larger company. Uh, if you, you know, don't keep your house in order as it relates to the way that you're drafting teaming agreements, and joint venture agreements, those can lead to affiliation issues, which can cause you to not be uh, eligible for a set aside contract. Um, keep in mind that direct ownership concerns can be an issue. So if you're a set aside entity, you generally can't be a subsidiary of another company. Um, hub zone companies excluded from that though. Um, so that's, you know, that could be a, a reason why you wouldn't be eligible. Um, particularly if you go through some sort of an acquisition and that's your, your ownership structure post acquisition is now indirect ownership being held as a subsidiary, that could be a problem for you. Um, also keep in mind that qualifying individuals for these different socioeconomic companies, they can usually only own one qualifying company. So um, that could just be another, another reason why you might not be eligible. But there's a whole host of reasons that uh, you know a company could lose its size, status, its size or socioeconomic status and, and could exceed um, the, either the revenue or the employee count for the, the specific size standard that they're dealing with. So lastly, I'm gonna to touch on false certifications. Uh, and the reason this is important is because there's a presumption of loss to the government that's based on the total amount that they spend on a contract whenever it's established that a business concern willfully sought and received the contract by a misrepresentation. Um, and the reason this matters is because every time you submit a proposal and every time you then are submitting invoices under contract, you're making representations. So if you submit a proposal for a set aside contract, you're making a representation that you're eligible for that contract. Um, and there can be very serious consequences for uh, making what's called a false certification. Um, there can be, you know, trouble damages. There can be this presumed loss rule, which can, you know, essentially equate to the whole value of the contract could be uh, docketed against you. 
Uh, so not to raise the alarm too much at the end of the presentation here, but I just say all of that because recertification, SAR status, it's a, it's a very murky area where there's a lot of tripwires that you want to be careful um, to avoid. And, you know, there is obviously, uh, you know, there's a knowing element of making a false claim. Like I, I noted there, it, it has to be established that you willfully sought and received a contract by a misrepresentation. So, you know, it's not the case that every time someone has a size protest filed against them that's successful, they are then on the hook for making a false certification. Um, that is not, a, you know, those two things are, are mutually exclusive just because you went after a contract and it was determined that you're ineligible for that contract. That doesn't mean that you willfully sought the contract through a misrepresentation. But I say that just because there could be ways that you're, you know, out there making representations and running your business uh, as it relates to, you know, your size and socioeconomic status where you, you know, if you're not careful, you could do something that crosses that line um, into the, the willfully sought territory. And, and that could come with some some serious repercussions. So that is uh, the end of our presentation today. I really appreciate everyone joining me. I'm gonna take a quick look. I know we're just about out of time here. I'm gonna take a look to see uh, what types of questions we have in the chat box here to see if I can answer any of these for the group um, before we break for the afternoon. It looks like we've got a Decent amount of questions here, so let me just take a look and see if I can answer any of these. Someone asks, uh, Jennifer asks, innovations can take a very long time. Is there a time limit on how long you have to submit complete innovation? Um, well, there's not a time limit on how long the government has to take, which is a pretty common answer, unfortunately, on a lot of things. Uh, so yes, I agree with you. It can take a long time to get innovation um, pushed through. And as far as how long you have to submit innovation, I don't think there's a black and white answer on that and in the regulations at all, but you know, I think the, it, you should submit the novation um, shortly after the transaction being finalized, uh, whether that's, you know, 30 days or 60 days or, or something longer, um, you know, it's probably a, a business decision and something we could chat about offline. But uh, yeah, generally these are things that you should be submitting, you know, close in time to when you're closing a deal. Uh, someone asked if we're a small business at the time of proposal, but are a large business by the time of award, can we still be considered a small business for that award? Uh, yes, um, provided you know that you're sometimes for design, build, two-step procurement, you know, there might be a, a different point in time at which you're making your size certification, but if when you submitted your initial proposal, you made your representation of size status, and then thereafter you just organically grew, be a large business, you can still be awarded the contract as a small business since you were small at the time you submitted your proposal. Unless, of course, you've grown to be large because of an acquisition, in which case we'd have to talk about that 180 day rule and your obligation to recertify in connection with pending proposals. Uh, this says for clarification, we, did, you, did I say that we have to re represent the long term contracts upon a board? Uh, no, you do not, but you do have to recertify at the fifth year mark of a long-term contract and in connection with the options that are issued after that. Uh, citation for the JV certification requirement. Uh, I don't know the exact subparagraph of the regulation. This is from Molly, um, but it is 13 CFR 121-404-G, somewhere in there. Um, is where that is specifically explained. Uh, Byron has asked a question about, uh, I believe this is a gross versus net revenue and how that accounts for size reporting. Byron, that's a little bit of a, a complicated question. It's not entirely related to today's presentation, but if you want to shoot me an email, we can chat offline about that question. Um, let's see here. How do contractors determine a contract type when FPDS categorizes a contract set-aside type as no set-aside and the extent competed as full and open in contradiction for the same contract? So um, Dina, I'm not exactly sure what you mean by determine the contract type there, whether it's a set-aside or not. 
Um, I mean, I would, you know, I what what the agency is holding itself out as as saying in the uh, SF 1449 um, is, you know, usually what what would control there. If they check the box and said it's a small business set aside, then that is uh, a good indication that it's a set aside. FPDS is populated by data that's input by um, different systems, so information there is not always totally accurate. Um, so it could be misleading what FPDS says. Um, okay, are SB regulations retroactive to contracts awarded prior to the change in the regulations? Great question, Mary. Um, that is unfortunately not, I don't have a black and white answer to that. I do have answer to that based on specific regulations by the specific facts. Um, but this is one that causes a lot of headache for people. Uh, a lot of the regulations themselves, when you look at the rulemaking, they will say they don't have a retroactive or preemptive effect. Um, but what that means exactly is not always clear. Sometimes you've got to look at the language, what SBA said that they uh, meant for the, the, the change in the regulation to apply to when they were issuing the new rules. Sometimes SBA will say, you know, hey, this rule applies to all solicitations issued after the effective date of this rulemaking. Uh, in which case, to be clear, it only applies to solicitations in the future. When there's silence on that, it can create a lot of, of questions. Um, and there are times when you might be able to argue that they are retroactive and times that you might be able to argue that they are not retroactive. Uh, if you've got a specific situation that you want to talk about, Mary, feel free to, to shoot me an email um, and we can, we can see if we can discuss it. Um, Dino, okay, looks like there's one more question from you here. It says if a contractor's awarded a WSB competed single award BPA, are all call orders considered WSB set aside, even if FBDS indicates no set aside used for some call orders? Again, this is related to the FBA, FBDS issue you mentioned in your last question, which I'm not totally tracking. Um, so if you want to shoot me an email, maybe we can chat about that offline as, as well. Um, but if they're, you know, I would say general rule, if you're getting a BPA that's set aside as a WOSB, then the, the orders that follow under it um, should be WOSB set aside. Okay, I think that uh, answers all the questions that I'm seeing here in the chat. So thanks again, everyone, so much for joining me this afternoon. Um, if anybody wants to schedule a time to talk um, about, you know, any of the information we talked about today or, or how myself or Claire Mazza might be able to work with your company in the future uh, with any government contracting issues you're facing or other legal issues in general, um, you have my contact information here in the presentation and feel free to, to send me an email and, and we can set something up. I really appreciate everyone's time. It was a Pleasure presenting to you and, and sharing information on this uh, important topic of, of recertification. So enjoy the rest of your afternoon, everyone. Thanks so much.